Most people think they understand the Middle East. They picture a region defined by oil, extreme heat, and political tension, the kind of place where the biggest problems are already obvious from the outside. But the truth is, the real danger shaping the future of every country in the region isn't what people argue about on the news. It's the crisis happening quietly, out of sight, and faster than governments can respond. Water Across the Middle East, rivers are shrinking, lakes are evaporating, and underground reservoirs that took thousands of years to form are disappearing in a matter of decades. Entire landscapes are drying so quickly that fields turn into dust between planting seasons. And behind every vanishing river and collapsing aquifer are millions of people caught in a silent emergency that doesn't make headlines, yet decides everything. This crisis is rewriting borders, crippling economies, and pushing countries toward a future where water isn't a resource. It's a lifeline. And while most of the region is losing that fight, there is one country that refused to accept what the desert tried to dictate. One country that looked at the same impossible conditions as its neighbors and said, no, we're rewriting the ending. This is the story of how that nation engineered water out of scarcity, turned the desert into farmland, and built a system so resilient that nature no longer decides its fate. And the way they did it is something the rest of the world can't afford to ignore. Across the Middle East, the, Paltan, the water crisis isn't a distant warning. It's happening right now, and it's happening faster than almost anyone predicted. Dry spells that were once rare are now the new normal. What used to be a bad year of rainfall has turned into a decade-long pattern. Climate models once laughed off as exaggerated are suddenly being outpaced by reality. Rivers are shrinking. Lakes are evaporating. Underground reservoirs are collapsing after thousands of years of stability. The pace is unnatural. In some places, it looks like environmental decline on fast forward. Land that once supported farms now fractures into dust. Water tables drop so quickly that wells become useless within a single generation. And as the water disappears, so does stability. Because in the Middle East, losing water doesn't just mean losing crops, it means losing livelihoods, cities, and entire ways of life. But to understand how serious things have become, you only have to look at the countries surrounding Israel. Iran Iran has one of the strongest agricultural traditions in the region. But with more than 80 million people drawing from the same shrinking supply, the system is cracking. Reservoirs are hitting dangerous lows. Wells that served families for generations have dried out completely. Farmers watch orchards that survived their parents' lifetimes die within a single summer. The situation became so extreme that government officials warned Tehran, home to nearly 9 million people, might need to be partially evacuated if rainfall didn't return. That wasn't fear-mongering. That was an admission. The water keeping Iran alive is running out. Iraq. This is the land shaped by the Tigris and Euphrates, the rivers that built some of humanity's earliest civilizations. Today, those rivers carry less than half the flow they once did. Entire communities have given up on planting crops because nothing survives the heat anymore. And in Basra, a city that once thrived as a port, seawater now pushes upstream into the freshwater system. Families turn on their taps and taste salt. Syria More than a decade of war already shattered the country, but drought layered a second crisis on top. Irrigation networks, pipes, and treatment facilities that once protected the country from drought were destroyed. Fields that fed entire regions now produce dust storms. Villages that survived conflict are struggling to outlast nature. Turkey Even at the headwaters of the region's major rivers, the crisis is visible. Sibirini saw a pace of Parts of the Kanya Plain have seen groundwater drop so quickly that sinkholes the size of buildings open up overnight. Farmers wake up to craters carved out of the earth where crops used to grow. Even Istanbul and Izmir, massive urban centers, are marching toward chronic water stress. Jordan and Yemen. Jordan's water supply per person is far below the level the United Nations considers stable. And in Yemen, after years of conflict, clean water is more valuable than oil because the systems needed to access it have collapsed. In the middle of all this, one country faced the same pressures, the same drought, the same shrinking lakes, and somehow went the other way. Israel has no natural advantage when it comes to water. Parts of the north get decent rainfall, 
but central and southern regions exist in near-desert conditions. The Negev, which covers more than half the country, barely sees any rain at all. For decades, Israel relied on the Sea of Galilee and a handful of underground aquifers. That worked when the population was small. But as cities grew, farming expanded, and the climate heated up, these sources were pushed to the limit. By the late 1990s, the Sea of Galilee reached levels so low that engineers feared long-term damage. Aquifers across the country fell to historic lows. Israel was heading toward the same fate its neighbors face now. But instead of accepting that trajectory, Israel made a decision that changed everything. Treat water scarcity as an engineering problem, not a destiny. Israel's shift began with a scientist named Alexander Zarkin. In the 1960s, Zarkin proposed a strange idea, freezing seawater under vacuum conditions so salt could be separated as the ice formed. The concept wasn't practical enough to scale, but it unlocked something far more valuable, a belief that seawater could become a national resource. Zarkin founded IDE Technologies, a company that would help push Israel into the global lead of water innovation. From there, Israel embraced reverse osmosis, a process that forces seawater through an ultra-thin membrane that blocks salt, but lets water molecules through. It wasn't a new invention globally, but Israel became the place where it finally reached national scale. The first major plant opened in Eilat in 1997. It wasn't huge, but it worked. And once it worked, Israel didn't wait. Ashkelon, 2005. One of the largest desalination plants in the world at the time. It delivered water so efficiently that experts outside Israel were stunned. Hadera, 2009. Even bigger, even more efficient. Sorek, 2013. A turning point. This plant used massive vertical pressure vessels that made operation cheaper and easier to maintain. It produced over 200 million cubic meters of fresh water a year, enough to supply a huge portion of the country on its own. And Israel didn't stop there. Additional facilities stretch along the Mediterranean coast, forming a chain of plants capable of producing more than the country needs. The breakthrough wasn't just about generating drinking water, it was about stability. Because desalination allowed Israel to do something no one expected. Pump water back into the Sea of Galilee. Pipes originally built to send lake water south now run in reverse, helping restore the lake's natural levels after years of decline. Israel stopped being a victim of drought, it became the engineer of its own supply. But desalination was only half the puzzle. Desalinated water is still relatively expensive, especially for agriculture. If Israel relied on desalination alone, farmers would struggle to afford irrigation. So the country built a second system, a system just as important as the first. Wastewater recycling, not basic treatment, not partial reuse, complete transformation. Israel recycles around 94% of its wastewater. For comparison, Spain, the second highest recycler, manages around 25%. The heart of the system is the Shafdan treatment plant near Tel Aviv. Every day, hundreds of millions of liters of sewage arrive at the facility. The water goes through several layers of purification, chemical treatment, biological filtering, and sediment removal. Most countries would stop there. Israel doesn't. After treatment, the water is sent into underground sand aquifers, where the sand naturally filters it again. This process can take months, but the result is water clean enough to irrigate crops that end up on supermarket shelves. Pipelines then carry this purified water into the Negev Desert, turning some of the driest land in the country into year-round farmland. Strict safety guidelines monitor salinity, metals, and chemical residues, ensuring the water supports crops without damaging the soil. The result? Farmers get a stable, predictable supply of irrigation water. Desalinated water goes directly to citizens. Natural water sources can rest, stabilize, and recover. This layered approach is what sets Israel apart. Israel's success didn't come from one technology. It came from building redundancy, multiple systems that back each other up. If rainfall collapses, desalination takes over. If desalination output dips, recycled water supports agriculture. If a lake drops too low, the national system can pump water back into it. If an aquifer sinks, the network adjusts. 
Everything is connected. Everything supports everything else. And nothing relies on nature behaving the way it used to. It's engineering designed for a future where the climate is unpredictable. But building this kind of network wasn't cheap or easy. Desalination facilities don't come cheap. Ashkelon cost around $250 million. Hadera passed $400 million. Sorek climbed toward $450 million. Sorek 2 breaks half a billion dollars by itself. And these numbers don't include the cross-country pipelines, pumping stations, reservoirs, or constant maintenance required to keep the system running. Reverse osmosis membranes wear out. Pumps need replacing. Pipes must be inspected. Nothing in the system is set it and forget it. Energy consumption is another major challenge. Desalination requires enormous pressure, which means enormous electricity. Countries trying to follow Israel's path need either strong energy infrastructure or renewable energy, like solar to offset the demand. Israel pays these costs because the alternative, running out of water, is far more expensive. At around 54 cents per cubic meter, the water produced is affordable enough to supply the nation. And over time, public skepticism faded. Early concerns about taste or environmental impact disappeared as reliability improved. Today, most Israelis drink desalinated water without even realizing it. Water is more than a resource. It's stability, it's food, it's national survival. Israel started in the same drought-stricken position as many of its neighbors. Its lakes were shrinking, its aquifers were collapsing, its climate was drying out. But instead of accepting that future, the country engineered its way out of it. It built pipelines, treatment plants, desalination centers, and recycling systems long before the crisis reached its peak. The transformation didn't happen overnight. It took decades of work, billions in investment, and a mindset that saw scarcity not as an ending, but as a challenge to be solved. Israel didn't escape the desert, it reshaped it. And as the world grows hotter and more unpredictable, its story offers a blueprint for other nations standing at the edge of their own water crisis. If you found this breakdown eye-opening, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. More stories are coming that explore how engineering, policy, and innovation are redesigning the world we rely on every single day.